Hi, my friends. Welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today we're going to be looking at what once was one of the most controversial beliefs of the ancient Epicureans. Let me give you a very quick, rough summary of what Epicureans are. So Epicureanism is a philosophy that was founded in Greece by a fellow named Epicurus. It is very materialistic, so they believe everything is just atoms flying around. There is no soul, no supernatural, and no objective morality. So everything is just atoms, and it's mostly chance that governs how atoms move, although they also seem to believe in something like what we might call natural laws. So there are constrictions on what the atoms can do. Then the way they organize their lives is that they are pursuing this goal of autoroxia, which is kind of difficult to translate into English. The default often is pleasure, but that makes it sound like they're hedonists, and Epicureans are definitely not that. They are very scared of getting involved in things like rat races, where you're constantly pursuing fame and possessions. They recognize that those are going to give you very little to no pleasure in the long term, and they're probably going to cause you more pain than pleasure. So maybe a better translation for autoroxia is just contentment or inner peace something like that. That's what they are striving to achieve. And with all of that said, you would think on the face of it that it's not very controversial or extreme in any way. Why would anyone hate these Epicureans? So the other ancient schools of philosophy disliked the Epicureans. They disagreed with them. They debated them all the time, but they more or less tolerated them. That is less the case when we get to Christianity. And in 1517, the Florentine Synod, I don't know what that is, but it sounds important, apparently banned all copies of Lucretius's De Rerum Natura from schools. Lucretius is an Epicurean author and De Rerum Natura is basically the premier book about Epicureanism from the ancient world. So they just banned it from schools. No one is allowed to read about Epicureanism anymore because uh, it is a lascivious, lascivious? I don't know how to pronounce that. I'm sorry. And wicked work in which every effort is used to demonstrate the mortality of the soul. Ooh, scandalous. And also, if we look at Dante's Inferno, in the part where they're in hell and they meet all of the heretics, the Epicureans are off in their own little special hell because they're particularly bad. Again, apparently because they believe that a man's soul, when his body does, will die. So they're just particularly evil for this reason. Nobody's banning Lucretius from schools anymore. They don't really have to. Nobody's reading him anyway, which is unfortunate because Lucretius is probably my favorite author from the ancient world. But anyway, uh, nobody hates him anymore, but I still think most people would disagree with him on this point. Even if you're not religious, a lot of people still have sort of a passive assumption or hope that there is some sort of a soul or essence that might go on after you die. And what we're gonna do now is look at all of Lucretius's arguments for why that is a load of crap. Starting with a really cool passage from book three, it goes, Moreover, when you see a serpent with flickering tongue, menacing tail, long body, if it please you, <laughs> I love how they, the translator put it, if it please you, uh, to cut up both parts with your steel into many pieces, you will see all the parts cut away writhing separately while the wound is fresh and bespattering the earth with gore and the forepart turning back and seeking to gnaw itself that by its bite it may assuage the burning pain of the wound which struck it. Shall we say then that there is a whole spirit in each of these fractions? But in that way, it will follow that one living creature has many spirits in its body. And so each must be considered mortal since each alike is cut asunder. So in summary, the idea is if you take a snake and you chop it in half, the two different halves will writhe and react differently to that same wound. And that raises the question of what is happening with the spirit here? If there was one originally and now there's two, then that means that that original soul, spirit, mind, whatever, wasn't immutable. It was changeable, it was dividable, it was killable, and that sort of defeats or contradicts the whole definition of an eternal soul. 
whether or not you agree with the argument of that passage. I've just always really loved the imagery. I think it's really graphic. It grabs you. It's emotional, interesting, memorable. I just, I really enjoy it. I think it's a cool passage. But Lucretius doesn't just wax poetical. He makes lots of other arguments as well. For instance, he brings up if the mind or the soul or whatever it is, is immortal, why does it change so much? Because 17 year old me was extremely cringe, but now me can now cringe at 17 year old me. Am I two different people? Is that two different souls? And if you look at say the soul of a one year old, it's very different from the soul of a 90 year old. It's like the mind is changing. It grows or it blooms as a child and then it seems to fade and deteriorate as you get older. And so if the soul can change so much while we're alive, then how is it something that is eternal and unchangeable? And he also takes a stab at people who believe in reincarnation because that was a fairly popular uh, idea in the ancient world. And he says basically if you're reincarnated, but you don't remember or know anything about your life before and after. And in each life, you're different and you change and you do different things, then effectively you're not the same person. You're a different person every time. And again, there's nothing really eternal, unchangeable, soul-like in that belief. So after spending some time and energy convincing you that you will for sure inevitably die very, very dead forever and ever, he then spends most of the book trying to convince you that you should feel okay about this. Um, you shouldn't be depressed about it at all. So to wrap up with this video, we're gonna look at some of the points he makes that he thinks are going to cheer you up. And I'm interested to hear if you think that they do or if they just make it worse. So point the first is basically that death is nothing to be scared of. So he says that some people say that short enjoyment is given to poor mankind, soon it will be gone and none will ever be able to recall it. And then he says, as if after death their chief trouble will be to be miserably consumed and parched by a burning thirst. So he's saying that sort of subconsciously, we all sometimes assume that death is being hungry, being lonely, being thirsty, that we because we don't get to do any of the things we do while we're alive. But he points out that no, it's not being thirsty, it's just not. <laughs> and he talks about, well, when the Carthaginian War was happening before all of us were born and Italy was being invaded by elephants and the fate of the nation was up for grabs, uh, did it bother you? Did it hurt? Were you worried? Were you scared? No, it didn't affect you at all. It didn't hurt you. It didn't scare you. You were totally fine because you didn't exist. And that is all that death is going to be. And he famously sort of sums that up as death is nothing to us, which sounds very wise, but sometimes he carries it a bit too far. For instance, at one point he's talking about how even if you die early and your children are crying because they miss you and now they're going to starve once you're gone and your wife is crying because she misses you and everyone at your funeral is crying because you died too early, even that will be nothing to you. You are just so free at that point, which I have to admit, even if true, usually I do not find very comforting. And real quick, three more points that are slightly less depressing. Point the first is if you've had a great life, then you should call it while you are ahead. No one to hold them, no one to fold them, nothing good lasts forever. So just leave the party while you're ahead. And if your life has been sucky and awful and miserable, then why are you sad about it being over? That should be more of a relief in his opinion. Point the second, is that if you're still feeling existential anxiety about death, then you should study nature because while you, your soul, not gonna be around forever, nature presumably is, it's eternal and you're a little piece of nature and that piece is gonna exist forever. So if you can get to know and appreciate and love nature that is never gonna die, then maybe that will bring you a little bit of peace of mind. And thirdly, he makes the point that if death is presumably eternal, then it doesn't matter what you do to try to put it off, death is still gonna be eternal. Even if you put off the starting point of death, 
you still have an eternity of being dead. Uh, so he argues that since you can't decrease death at all, then you shouldn't feel any anxiety or spend any time or effort trying to shorten that death. You've already lost, so just embrace it. I don't know how much I agree or disagree with any of those points. People much smarter than I am have thought about these way more, um, but I just find it interesting. I find the ideas interesting and also the reaction to the ideas that people for quite a long time thought that these were horrible, poisonous, that they needed to be banned from schools and kept from the minds of our youth. Um, it was just, it's weird and, and fascinating. So I'm interested to hear what your reactions and thoughts are. A uh, special thank you as always to subscribers and to Patreon members. I hope to see all of you again next week. Karate.